Here's what's coming up on the world today. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says Crimea is Ukrainian and will never give it up after a string of explosions at an airbase left at least one person dead there. Water still high in the South Korean campus on the day after it experienced its worst flooding in decades. And Kenyans await results of yesterday's presidential election as vote counting continues with no clear majority. Well, welcome to our viewers here in Nigeria and around the world. Thanks for joining us this full hour of our coverage of major issues around the world. I'm Amarachi Ubani. As we go up to speed on developments from the Russian invasion of Ukraine the last couple of hours, Russia has requested an urgent meeting of the UN Security Council tomorrow to discuss the situation at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. The meeting was requested by Russia's representative to international organizations in Vienna, Mikhail Yulanov. Yulanov accuses Kyiv of creating artificial obstacles and difficulties to a potential International Atomic Energy Agency mission to the nuclear power plant. Meanwhile, the G7 leaders say they remain profoundly concerned by the serious threat posed by Russia's actions around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, saying actions by Russian armed forces are significantly raising the risk of a nuclear accident or incident and endangering the population of Ukraine, neighboring states and the international community. Leaders reiterate their, their strongest condemnation of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which they call an unprovoked and unjustified war of aggression. The G7 wants Russia to immediately hand back full control of the power plant to Ukraine. IAEA chief Rafael Mariano Grossi says shelling at Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear power plant violates virtually all seven nuclear safety and security pillars. Grossi, however, says the shelling has not caused an immediate nuclear safety threat based on information provided by Ukraine. Then the United States has announced it will provide $89 million to Ukraine for removing landmines put in place by Russian forces. About 160,000 mines have been defused in Ukraine in March, but around 5 million Ukrainians still live in areas threatened by bombs planted by the Russians. And now that we're all cut up, Ukrainian, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says the safety of the Black Sea region would remain under threat while Russia's annexation of Crimea continues. He made the comment after the attack on a Russian air base near seaside resorts in the annexed Crimean Peninsula. Ukraine has not claimed responsibility for the attack, and Moscow says the blasts occurred after the detonations. Those who witnessed the attack on Crimea on Tuesday say they heard at least 12 explosions around 3.30 p.m. local time from the Saki Air Base near Novodorovka on the west coast of the peninsula. Residential buildings in Novofedorovka were damaged to affected citizens were offered evacuation to a hostel in Saki. Evacuees uh, also say that they were provided with decent housing conditions and meals. Crimea is a holiday destination for many Russians. It's so far been spared the bombardment and artillery combat that other areas of eastern and southern Ukraine have suffered. The Russian Defense Ministry is adamant, however, the detonation of several aviation ammunition stores had caused an explosion. It initially said no one had been harmed. It also said there'd been no attack and no aviation equipment had been damaged. Also reviewing damages in the Kush, is the Kushim settlement on the outskirts of Ukraine's Zaporizhia region. A dozens of homes were damaged following a rocket attack earlier today. Uh, following the attacks, residents uh, sifted through the site, inspecting damage done to their homes as authorities worked to reconnect electric cables that were also damaged in the attack. Uh, Moscow says it does not deliberately target civilians in what it calls its special operation in Ukraine, uh, aimed at preemptively safeguarding its own security against expansion of the NATO military alliance. But staying with today's attacks, uh, the Russian Defense Ministry says Russian forces have destroyed a German-supplied anti-aircraft system in use by Ukrainian forces in the Mykolaiv region. During its daily briefing, the Defense Ministry also said it had shot down three Ukrainian warplanes in the Mykolaiv region, as well as seven high-mass missiles in the neighboring Kherson.
But back in Russia, state security services have searched the house of former state TV journalist Marina Ovsinikova, who in March denounced the war in Ukraine during a live news bulletin on television. Writing on Instagram earlier today, her lawyer, Dmitry Zakitov, said that a criminal case had been opened against her and under Russia's law, criminalizing the spreading of fake information about the Russian army. She is Ukrainian-born and rose to prominence when the then-editor on Russia's flagship channel one mounted a protest against the conflict in Ukraine on a nightly news broadcast. She has since been arrested and fined for her continued opposition to Russia's military campaign in several times. I want to bring in the VOA's Anna Chernikova, who's in Kyiv. Anna, great to see you. President Zelensky seems determined to retake Crimea, which has been under Russian annexation since 2014. How realistic is his objective uh, to Ukrainians? Uh, good evening. Uh, well, Ukraine, from the very first uh, day of full-scale war and uh, uh, from the very first day of war itself, the happened uh, that started in 2014 um, was stating that um, it is determined to return its territories according to the internationally recognized border. So uh, in Ukraine and Ukrainian officials have already confirmed it a couple of times um, that Ukraine is determined to return all the territories. However, um, and this is basically um, uh, goes in line with uh, what President Zelensky uh, said recently uh, regarding Crimea that everything started with Crimea and should be finished with its liberation. Uh, Ukraine, uh, of course, is determined because it's very important uh, region and safety of this region uh, is even more important because while uh, Russia is controlling the peninsula, um, the peninsula is a, a certain, uh, you know, um, Basically, it is a military base. So, uh, and of course, it's a great threat for Ukraine and a great threat for the uh, Black Sea region in particular. So, I guess this is uh, this is kind of understandable why Ukraine is, uh, you know, um, is looking forward to it because first of all, this is Ukrainian territory under all the uh, international. Um, documents and recognized internationally uh, and secondly it's about safety of the region but it is being controlled by russia isn't it yes it is controlled by russia it was annexed uh, in 2014 yeah, indeed um, but there's been no claim of responsibility on, on the attacks of the attacks on crimea uh, and the ukrainian government still not responding to that uh, russia already blames ukraine is there some truth there uh, is russia right uh, that ukrainian forces were behind the attacks on the air base in crimea uh, well taking into consideration that this is the the main air base in Crimea, and this is the air base, uh, the main air base which is uh, involved in this war. Uh, I would remind that uh, Russia is using this particular air base for attacks on the south regions uh, of Ukraine, uh, and um, definitely, it's you know, you know, it's very, um, let's say, um, very interesting coincidence that this happens in this particular moment, uh, um, and it happens in general at this particular air base. Uh, Ukrainian officials have not confirmed, uh, neither confirmed nor said that uh, th 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 this, is, this is, you know. Um, this was not done by the Ukrainians. However, Ukrainian officials said that uh, Kyiv is not responsible for that. Uh, but it was not a direct, you know, um, speech by the official that uh, Kyiv has nothing to do with this. They did not confirm. So it's def difficult to say, but of course we should uh, follow the official uh, announcements and we cannot independently confirm if, uh, you know, if it was done by the Ukrainian forces or not. Uh, 
even more, uh, of course, we understand that it could be done differently. So there are different ways of doing this. It could be done from the inside. It could be done from the outside. So uh, for the moment, we don't have confirmation. But of course, we all understand that um, this is a very, uh, you know, if this is a coincidence, it's, very, it's pretty much in time. And uh, of course, it's uh, quite a positive coincidence for Ukraine. Uh, I think that, uh, and here inside, in, inside the country, and um, a lot of, of course, a lot of sources and experts are talking about this. And of course, there are um, there are um, different uh, ma um, uh, d different ideas about what it could be. Uh, uh, again, official confirmation we don't have. Uh, if we analyze it and look at it, uh, of course, it looks like um, quite uh, a great, um, you know action for Ukraine uh, in terms of uh, of this war in general and the future of, of this war. And we also can see that uh, the um, the military, um, the, hot, the main hotspot now is moving from Donbass to Kherson region to the south. Uh, so it all goes basically in line. Um, unfortunately, I cannot confirm, uh, again, according to all the official statements, but we will see how all this will, uh, you know, evolve because uh, it looks like uh, this is not um, the only, you know, accident that might happen in in, in the following uh, weeks or months. Yeah, and and uh, um, Crimea had been annexed since 2014, and no Ukrainian leader had said anything about it then. I remember the U.S. then U.S. President Barack Obama um, did say, uh, um, well, did react, you know, to uh, um, Russia annexing Crimea. So, would it be a major victory for President Zelensky if he could retake Crimea under the guise of this war? Uh, I think that for any president and taking and considering Mr. Zelensky is a, is an acting president, it would be um, a great geopolitical victory, a great uh, national victory, of course. Um, you know, it's important to understand that since 2014, Ukraine is under the war. And since uh, 2014, uh, Ukraine um, has been, you know, Russia has taken the land from Ukraine, and uh, Crimea uh, is, you know, is a very uh, rich land. It's a, it's touristic place, uh, a very popular touristic destination, and uh, it was one of the main touristic destination in Ukraine. So it's a great economic loss for Ukraine. Uh, also, this is a region, uh, the Vinery region. So. Uh, a lot of production. It's uh, it's the warmest part of the country. So economically, it was a great loss. It was a great hit for Ukraine. Uh, this is one thing. Another thing, of course, geopolitically, and I mean, it's just unprecedented uh, what happened because it's a huge territory. Uh, if we look at it, uh, it's uh, it, it has a lot of resources in there. So for President Zelensky, as for any president of Ukraine, it would be definitely a great political victory and a great, uh, I mean, I will just repeat myself, national victory because of all this uh, point that I mentioned already. There is great concern over the safety in uh, Zaporizhia, which is where Europe's largest nuclear plant is located. Uh, the big following the attacks on Saturday, uh, the IEA wants to inspect it, as uh, given its importance. What's stopping the uh, inspectors from getting to Zaporizhia? Uh, well, uh, the plant, unfortunately, is currently under Russian control, uh, and Russian side do not allow anyone to get in. Uh, we only know that uh, Rosatom, which is Russian uh, energy at, at atomic agency, uh, is there, and um, representatives of this organization are um, kind of controlling all the all the processes which are happening. Ukrainian workers are are kept there as hostages for the moment. Uh, so um, Russia has full responsibility of uh, either providing access or not, because Ukrainian side, of course, supporting this idea that uh, it should be international control, because Ukraine also cannot access the site. 
and uh, unfortunately a lot of damages have been done already by Russian shootings of the of the site uh, and uh, we know for the moment that a couple of lines were damaged and are not operating so it's only one power line is now operating and if this one uh, is um, cut for instance then uh, generators would come in action and if generators come in action then we only can hope that these generators can actually keep the plant uh, going because um, otherwise it could be well it will be a catastrophic effect to not only for for ukraine but uh, well for for, for, for for quite a, a huge territory in europe including yeah, very understandably. And there were more attacks or so. In uh, Mykolaiv, Zaporizhia and Marinet, what's the update from these areas? Um, yeah, well, um, it, the main attack that we experienced over the, uh, over the night in Ukraine was attack uh, at Dnipropetrovsk region. Unfortunately, civilian areas were suffered, uh, were hit and uh, a lot of civilians suffered. Uh, we know that residential areas, a couple of residential areas were under attack. Uh, for the moment, 13 casualties are confirmed, so 13 people dead and 11 injured. This is what we know uh, for the moment, but of course we understand that uh, numbers could change. Um, if we talk about Mykolaiv, Mykolaiv is one of the most shelled areas for the moment in general. So, uh, of course, of course, Donbass uh, is... The, the, uh, has the same picture, but uh, Mykolaiv in the south uh, is suffering very much. Uh, again, residential areas mostly, and we hear about a lot of damages of the farmer uh, fields as well, because this is a region with a lot of farming um, territories. Um, so, uh, and if we look in general at the front line, we can uh, definitely see that uh, in the south, uh, the main hotspot is moving now to the south, but still we should not forget about Donbass, about, in, in particular about Pisky region, uh, because um, uh, Ukrainian officials, military officials, um, describe what's happening in Donbass in Pisky region as hell on the earth. Uh, and it's hell for both sides, for Ukrainian army and for Russian army, because very heavy fighting are happening. Uh, we know that uh, Ukrainian uh, army managed to uh, keep uh, the front line uh, unchanged and uh, Russian forces did not manage to advance. At least, uh, you know, if we look at the, at the front line as a whole. In some, in some areas, Ukrainians advance, in some areas, Russian forces uh, also have certain um, advances, but this is not uh, something that changed uh, front line, um, you know, um, let's say, any uh, visibly. Uh, so I should say that uh, Mykolaiv, Dnipropetrovsk region, regions and Kharkiv region uh, also uh, are some regions under the most shelling for the moment. Well, Anna, continue to stay safe in Kyiv. Uh, keep us updated on developments there. Thanks again. Thank you. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is in Latvia, arriving yesterday for a two-day visit. During his meeting with Prime Minister Christianis Karens in Riga, he said the U.S. will keep working closely with NATO partners to support Ukraine and neighboring countries, adding that the U.S. would enhance its presence in the region and intensify training with Baltic areas, uh, Baltic allies. A NATO and European partner uh, Latvia plans to graduate, gradually raise its defense budget to 2.5 percent gross to domestic product by 2025 from around 2% now as a boost security after its neighbor Russia sent troops to Ukraine in February. Uh, the outcome of Russian invasion of Ukraine must have only one result, which means Russia must lose and Ukraine must win. And I heard some people maybe sometimes telling we shall not allow Ukrainians to lose. No, no, no. It's too less. Ukraine must win because if Ukraine is not winning this war with our assistance, then earlier or later the stress will come and the war might come at our borders. And we don't want that. So Ukrainians are fighting now our war. Unfortunately, Russians are doing this together with Belarus. And we must use all the means, economic, social, diplomatic, political and military, to stop this aggressor. 
And NATO is strengthening its forward defenses and enhancing its battle groups in the eastern part of the alliance up to brigade level. The United States is also enhancing its presence along the, alliance, the alliance's east, and we will maintain a persistent and rotational presence in the, Balt in the Baltics, including Latvia. So let's be clear. We seek no confrontation and pose no threat to Russia. Our updated posture simply reflects our ongoing and solemn commitment to Article 5. An attack on one NATO ally is an attack on every NATO ally. Back in the United States, President Joe Biden on Tuesday signed documents endorsing Finland and Sweden's accession to NATO, the most significant expansion of the military alliance since the 1990s as a response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. President Biden signed the U.S. instrument of ratification, welcoming the two countries, and the final step for the endorsement by the United States. Well, coming up after the break... Taiwan releases video of anti-invasion exercise by its armed forces in response to China's recent display of power. Stay with us. Welcome back to the program. Spanish Coast Guards have rescued 61 sub-Saharan migrants approaching Gran Canaria's coast in a wooden boat. Late Tuesday evening, Coast Guards reached the boat sailing four miles off Arganin port in the Atlantic Ocean and transferred the migrants to a rescue boat. And while the migrants, all of them male, were attended by emergency services, police found the body of a 19-year-old male undercover in the wooden boat. According to Interior Ministry figures, more than 9,589 migrants have arrived in the Canary Islands by sea up until July 31st. That's a 27.3% increase over the same period last year. Speaking of last year, 4,400 people were lost at sea, attempting to reach Spain, according to monitoring group Walking Borders. In the meantime, authorities have been searching for dozens of migrants missing from a sunken boat after Greece's Coast Guard rescued 29 in the Asian Sea today. Those, uh, the spokesperson for the Coast Guard uh, said the rescued migrants uh, told them the boats had set out from Antalya, Turkey, heading towards Italy with 60 to 80 people aboard. It capsized and sunk off the island of Kapathos, 38 nautical miles south of Rhodes. A search and rescue operation had begun in the early morning and amid strong winds. The Navy and Air Force are assisting Coast Guard officials and at least six vessels and a Super Puma helicopter have been taking part in the operations with Coast Guard video showing some of the migrants being pulled onto the helicopter from the Sea of Darkness. The rescued migrants were from Afghanistan, Iran and Iraq. Another Coast Guard official uh, declared this on anonymity. Irregular migration is also a problem in Sri Lanka, where a naval vessel uh, has been spotted above deck. Uh, sight of a fishing trawler floating unusually low in the water, a sign that it's smuggling people. Officers navigating the vessel approach the trawler, and bare-chested fishermen stare as a five-man detail clamor clamor on board armed with machine guns and batons. Uh, they search the men and the boat, but it's carrying little more than nets and fish. A daily patrol is among operations now being conducted with increasing regularity along the South Asian nation's coastline as people smugglers attempt to capitalize on a surge of people looking for a way out of crisis hit Sri Lanka. However, boats involving uh, people smuggling operations like the one in Nino Makala uh, and uh, another couple uh, who is on the boat still make it through, slipping past the patrols under the cover of darkness. Many do make it to Australian waters, however, but they are caught and subsequently deported back to Sri Lanka and prosecuted. And speaking of Sri Lanka, ousted President Gotabaya Rajapaksa is expected to arrive in Thailand tomorrow, seeking temporary shelter in a second Southeast Asian country after fleeing his island nation last month amid mass protests. Sri Lanka's foreign ministry has not responded to requests for comment, but 
a Thai government spokesperson says that they also have no comments on the issue. The first Sri Lankan president to quit midterm, Ratapaska, has fled to Singapore. Fled to Singapore on July 14 via the Maldives, following unprecedented unrest triggered by Sri Lanka's worst economic crisis in seven decades. Rajapaska has not made any public appearances or comments since leaving Sri Lanka, and the Singaporean government said the month the city state had not accorded him any privileges or immunity. Let's check in on the South Korean capital, which was hit by immense floods yesterday. Well, the floods have exposed the difference in living conditions across the city for citizens. Floods have caused inconvenience and losses in wealthier parts of the capital. At the glitzy Ganem neighborhood, a few miles away, but in places like Silim, the floods have snuffed out what little hope desperate people have had to clung to in order just to keep going. Large swathes of Silim remain flooded, while in Ganem, most roads have been cleared and traffic is back to normal. An official at the Guanak District Office, which covers Silim, says recovery efforts can be slower in the Silim due to the concentration of tiny apartments and houses lining the streets, unlike in Ganem, which has wider boulevards and office buildings. On Monday, three family members living in the neighborhood, including a woman with developmental disabilities, drowned in their lower ground apartment. According to the Korea Meteorological Administration, at least 10 people have perished as a result of the torrential rains that have swept across the northern part of the country. This was the lodge brought the heaviest rains in 115 years in Seoul. Health issues. Now, a tourist stranded on Hainan Island battling a recent COVID-19 outbreak has spoken about his disappointment of being placed under lockdown again after a failed attempt to leave the holiday spot. Shanghai Bay's American expert, Micah Hostetter, and his wife, Anna, had changed their flight back home to August 6, a day earlier, in an attempt to avoid a COVID-19 lockdown. But 20 minutes after the couple checked in at the airport and went through the security, they were told that all flights from Sanya had been cancelled. A lockdown was announced on August 6th with transport links restricted to try to stem the outbreak. Many tourists like Hostetter are now stuck inside hotels until Saturday, if not longer. At least nine cities and towns in Hainan with a combined, a combined population of 7 million say their residents must not leave where they live except for necessary reasons such as COVID tests, grocery shopping or essential job roles. So we got to the airport and um, uh, we we're able to get into the terminal. Um, we look up at the screen, we just see a sea of red, all these cancellations. Um, but we noticed our flight, which was leaving to Shanghai, I think it was at 3 p.m. or 2, 2 p.m. It was still um, on schedule. Um, so we checked in, checked our luggage and got through security. We we're going to our gate and about 20 late, 20 minutes later, they said all flights from Sanya were, were canceled. It's, it's disappointing. Uh, and as I mentioned before, it's just like we, we were locked down in Shanghai for two and a half months and we we're just like, wow, we can't believe this is actually happening again. This is so unlucky. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's, it's one thing you just have to, you just have to live with and, and just hope that, um, we're able to, to get back to Shanghai as early as possible. It's not, uh, quite like, I guess the Shanghai lockdown where we couldn't step a foot out our door. Um, but it's, it seems to be a little bit, um, more relaxed, but it, it's difficult to tell. Maybe that it, it could just be, um, for people that tourists that are stranded in, say, at hotels. Um, we've heard stories that, there, that the, the residents of Sanya that are in their apartment buildings might actually um, be having a more difficult time. Speaking of the coronavirus, the Chinese mainland on Tuesday reported 380 newly locally transmitted confirmed COVID-19 cases and 64 imported ones, according to the National Health Commission's report. The local cases, uh, 285 were reported in Hainan, 39 in Guangdong, 27 in Inner Mongolia, Autonomous Region, 10 in Tibet, Autonomous Region, 8 in Fujian, 5 in Zhejiang, 2 in Guangxi, Zhuang, Autonomous Region, and 1 each in Hubei, Chongqing, Sichuan, and Guizhou. On Tuesday, 109 COVID-19 patients were discharged from hospital after recovery, including 56 local cases, 
and 8,495 close contacts were released from medical observation. The number of local severe cases increased by two from the previous day. A Chinese mainland has cumulatively reported 21,241 imported confirmed cases with no deaths. Among them, over 20,600 have been discharged from hospital following recovery, while 607 remain hospitalized with two in severe condition. But China is dealing with a new virus. It began tracking, researchers around the world have begun tracking a newly identified virus in China with dozens of cases recorded so far. It's called the Novel Langer Henipa virus. It was first detected in the northeastern provinces of Shandong and Henan in late 2018, but was formally identified by scientists last week. That virus was likely transmitted from animals to humans, according to scientists. Uh, Taiwan's health authority is now monitoring the spread. Researchers tested wild animals and found lavi viral RNA in more than a quarter of 262 shrews, a finding that suggests a shrew may be a natural reservoir. A virus was also detected in 2% of domestic goats and 5% of dogs. Initial investigations into the virus were outlined in correspondence published by scientists from China, Singapore and Australia in the New England Journal of Medicine last week. And when people, the virus caused symptoms including fever, fatigue, cough, loss of appetite and muscle aches. All of the people infected had a fever, according to scientists. The virus was the only potential pathogen found in 26 of the 35 people, suggesting that Lavi, Lav, Lav, beg your pardon, or LAV uh, was the cause of the febrile, febrile illness. There have been no deaths from LAV to date. According to Professor Wang Linfer of the Duke NUS Medical School, a co-author of the paper on the virus, uh, the LAVI cases have not been fatal or very serious so far, and there is no need for panic, he says. It appears the world can hardly catch a break from these viruses. Joining me now is virologist and senior lecturer, Nasara State University, Dr. Akila Ishaku, who joins me uh, from the Nasara State uh, capital, Begapan in Abuja. Thank you for joining me, Dr. Ishaku. So nice to have you this evening. Are you also confident, you know, this virus is not deadly? Uh, do you also think that there's nothing to worry about? Yeah, so thank you for having me. Thank you for having me and good evening viewers. Uh, I think uh, based on the WHO dashboard, it is not uh, an outbreak of a viral disease that we should be panic about, but it's just that we just need to maintain some certain safety measures. Uh, you'll be just like the way you establish a background, a uh, Lange virus is actually a zoonotic disease, a disease uh, of animal origin, just like the way you establish from shoes, which are natural reservoirs, but they are transmissible or they can be transmitted from animals, the shoes to humans. And so um, basically it is a fluke like uh, a viral hemorrhagic disease, uh, which has the complications of uh, uh, fluke-like uh, clinical presentation of fatigue, of uh, headache, of nausea. Sometimes it leads to also liver and kidney failure. And so uh, in these 35 patients that you established from your background, it clinically shows that they have similar presentations of signs and symptoms. Uh, but it has not been established human to human transmission and that's why we don't need to panic about it but another danger about re-emerging viruses most especially rna viruses is their mutation cap capability and capacity and that's why you can see sars-cov-2 also uh, changes its gen genomic makeup and then you find out that it's you know changes its uh, genetic material and then mutates over time so uh, uh nothing to panic about uh, because uh, human to human transmission has not been established, but we also need to actually limit our contact with wild animals, which is quite key. And also, we just need to also be on a very active surveillance search for people traveling, most especially from China into Nigeria, to carry out genomic surveillance.
Yeah, that's a, that's a really important point, isn't it? But the shrew itself is found here in Africa, in Nigeria in particular. I think it's, it does look like a rat, isn't it? It's basically a rat. And rats are also associated with Lassa fever. So, um, you know, people are probably wondering, you know, if they should be even more careful now about um, some of these pests in their homes. Actually, um, it's shrews are not found in, in, in Africa basically because of the climatic weather condition, but it also needs to also, so we don't also understand the dynamics of human to human transmission. So the issue there is that uh, if in the coming days to come, in the coming weeks to come, we establish human to human transmission. Uh, it shows that uh, human to animal trans transmission can also be established. So uh, we need to be also be vigilant and to be very careful also in having contact with with, with. That is what is being established in China. Who knows whether the, the same virus is being uh, found in, uh, in in our animals over here? I hope you know that we have what is called the Ghanaian pet virus. Uh, the Ghanaian virus to the SEDA virus are of the same family with uh, the Lange or Lange V virus. So it's very common in West Africa, other associated RNA viruses that belong to the same family. Uh, so we need to also be careful so that this virus don't undergo mutation uh, if human to human transmission has been established. So I agree with you that the shoes are not found in Africa, but maybe perhaps other zoonotic, um, they can cohabit with other viruses. Another point again for us to also be careful about is that you know that people transmit, uh, people transport animals. There is a transporter animal, uh, you know, people move animals from one joke political zone to another, another. also people also move a uh, source of protein, which are meats. Uh, from, so we have a lot of Chinese over here. Uh, and you know that shoes are used as delicacies in China. So what happens if they import these meats from China down to Nigeria? So we have to also look at our food safety component, which is quite key. Uh, I am quite uh, not, so it shows that with the emergence of a lot of zoonotic diseases, as a nation, we need to also update our food safety policies and protocols. But does it does it worry you um, the the timing, you know, of this of these zoonotic diseases? We're hardly done with the coronavirus, and then there's the monkeypox, and now we're talking uh, Langia hennepa virus. Uh, the Vel hanging Novel Langia Hennepa virus. I know it's a bit of a mouthful, um, but does it does it concern you? You know that we're dealing with so much, you know, in such a short period of time. Yeah, we are dealing with so much on over a short period of time because of global international travels, uh, because of also global warming. You know that uh, uh, we we undergo we 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 take activities in deforestation, and so these animals, need, you know, leave uh, their habitation and then also cohabit with humans. Uh, you will also uh, agree with me that we also used most of these uh, animals as source of proteins, uh, most especially in Africa where we use rat and also uh, the reservoirs for lots of people. In China, they virtually eat everything. They have what is called wet market in Haunan. I've been there. I see them eating live uh, wild animals. So you find out that those are source of uh, uh, transmission of zoonotic diseases, uh, which, which are quite key. So I, I think um, it's, a, it's a thing of concern for me uh, as a virologist because most especially these are RNA viruses that can undergo mutation one. They can also emerge and re-emerge again uh, due to the mutations that they undergo. So it is a thing of concern that we just need to be careful uh, how we relate and most especially mount surveillance on our borders, which is quite key. So the Port Authority, Health Port Authority needs to do a lot in terms of generating database, in terms of keeping catalog of people that travel and they will go into genomic sequencing and genomic surveillance. Dr. Akela Ishaka, you've touched all the areas uh, and called in everyone who should be calling uh, to look at this. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Well, we take another break now when we come back. Honoring Olivia Newton-John, Sydney's Opera House lights up in pink to honor the Australian entertainment icon.
Welcome back. Taiwan's defense ministry has released a video of anti-invasion exercises by its armed forces. There it is. In response to China's recent display of military power around the self ruled island. A photo shows multiple warships from China and Taiwan sailed at close quarters in the Taiwan Straits. Chinese warships were also seen, including frigate Anyang and Manansion. The island's defense ministry says multiple Chinese military ships, aircraft and drones are simulating attacks on the island and its navy. And it said it sent aircraft and ships to react appropriately. A video's on-screen text says its military is at the ready, keeping the country safe and China has not stopped its incursions nearby. China's military has announced it has completed various tasks around Taiwan today, but will conduct regular patrols, potentially signaling an end to days of war games, but also that Beijing will keep up its pressure on the island. In the meantime, China has released a white paper titled The Taiwan Question and China's Reunification in the New Era, reiterating its claims on the self ruled island with over 22 million people. It comes a week after U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, which led to tensions in the Taiwan Strait. Chinese state media say the white paper was released to reiterate the fact that Taiwan is part of China and to demonstrate the resolve of the Communist Party of China and the commitment to national reunification. According to local news in China, the white paper emphasizes the position and policies of the CPC and the Chinese government in the new era. It states that Taiwan belongs to China since ancient times, stating that this claim has no sound basis in history and jurisprudence. And staying with the aftermath of Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, China says it will resolutely fight back every U.S. provocation act that undermines its sovereignty and territorial integrity and meddles with its internal affairs. Asked to comment on U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's remarks on Friday that the U.S. will not allow China isolate Taiwan after her visit to the island on August 2nd, Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin says Pelosi, as the number three figure in the U.S. government, who flew to Taiwan on an American military plane, was speaking on behalf of the United States throughout her stay in Taiwan. Wang notes China has warned the U.S. well in advance that should Pelosi visit Taiwan, it will cause a crisis and major disruptions to China. U.S. exchanges and cooperation. Unfortunately, the U.S. side ignored that and went ahead with the visit. A spokesperson urges the United States to give up using Taiwan to contain China, play no games, but return to the one China principle and the three joint communiques and do the right thing, take concrete steps to facilitate the steady development of China-U.S. relations. Kenyans are still awaiting the results of Tuesday's general election, even as provincial results suggest a tight presidential race between Deputy President William Ruto and former Prime Minister Raila Odinga. With more than 90% of results posted from thousands of individual districts, local tallies of the raw data suggest little separates the pair. However, officials say it could be several days before the official result is known. I'm seeing everything is going on well, and uh, we want just peace to prevail in this particular area uh, because it was treated as a hot spot and you don't want such kind of a thing. And what we want to say is that whoever will win, let him carry the, 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 the button. For now, uh, people have gotten used to um, such panic, and like in the previous years, uh, business is going on as usual. As you can see, uh, there are quite a number of people going on with their business because um, one thing that we need to know is that uh, these politicians are friends and uh, the common people, as we talk now, cannot um, in any way uh, try to harm his or her colleague. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says Washington is very concerned about what he called credible reports that Rwanda has provided support to rebels in the neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo. Mr. Blinken is in the Congolese capital, Kinshasa. He has called on all parties to halt any cooperation with the M23 rebel group. A conference in eastern DR Congo was a key focus during his meeting 
with President Felix Shisekedi on Tuesday. M33 controls a large swathe of territory in the region and its attacks have displaced tens of thousands of people. Five students from the American University in Cairo have developed a non-invasive glucose monitoring device for diabetic patients. That device was built to serve as a substitute to a finger pricking procedure. A team believes more work can be done on the device to improve its accuracy further before offering it to the market. Watch. Five Egyptian students have won first place in a global healthcare design competition for a non-invasive glucose monitoring device. The students from the American University in Cairo say the glucolip aims to serve as a substitute for finger pricking or other invasive blood tests, potentially influencing lives of millions of diabetics around the world. One of the graduated students, Saif Shautak, says the device is like the oximeter, which monitors oxygen levels in the blood. The person who wants glucose levels checked should place his finger in the device and press the button or use the application that is connected to the device via Bluetooth. Once you press the button, the device starts to check glucose levels in the blood. Then figures are shown on the device and the application. Maha Shata says when the team heard of the competition, they had already finished working on the device and had a prototype. When we heard of the competition, we applied immediately and thank God we managed to get awarded out of the 120 teams participating in the competition. Students say they hope more tests will be done on the device to release it into the market. We think in the coming years, the most important thing is to work more on the device to improve its accuracy further, so then we can think about offering it to the market. But before that, and because this is a medical device, we should make sure that the accuracy is high enough for anyone to safely use. The device uses near-infrared spectroscopy and connects to a mobile app, allowing easier and more convenient monitoring of blood glucose levels. The device won first place in 2022 John Hopkins Healthcare Design Competition in the Digital Health Track. Matera, the location of a 2019 James Bond film, No Time to Die, saw a dramatic real-life rescue scene this week after a hiker was injured in the ancient southern Italian city. A firefighter helicopter rescued a man who was injured when he was hiking near the banks of the Gravina River on the outskirts of Matera, a city evoking early Christian and even prehistoric times. A rescue operation was carried out with a stunning backdrop of the city's sassy limestone cave dwellings dug into the hillside and cascading in gravity-defying fashion down a steep slope towards the river. The spectacular rescue ended successfully as the hiker was transferred to the Madonna Delhi Grashi Hospital in Matera with a leg fracture. It's pink today, talking about the iconic um, adaptation of the star film of the musical Grease. Uh, we're looking at the uh, iconic building in Australia uh, where former, well, Australian native Oliver Newton-John is being honoured. Uh, Newton was born in Cambridge, England in 1948. She went on to win four Grammy Awards and numerous American Music Awards as well as a star in the film adaptation of the musical Grease. So she, when she was six, the family moved to Melbourne, Australia, where she appeared on talent shows in a telly movie. And after winning the prize of a trip to Britain, Newton John travelled to her country of birth, where she recorded a single and toured nightclubs around. Europe as part of a singing duo. She died on Monday at her ranch in California.
very sad. I guess my first encounter was through Greece. I remember going to the movies to see it, and uh, she was amazing, uh, as was John Travolta, but uh, it's one of my favorite films of all time. So it's very sad to hear her going. And she was so young, really, 73. Uh, very sad. Yeah, yeah, she's an Australian icon. Yep. Miss, going to miss her a lot. And she's done so much for Australia with her clinics down, the wellness clinics um, down in Melbourne. So, yeah, real yes. shock. Sadness. Yeah. Good memories, too. Yeah. Great singer, great Australian icon. True Aussie. Yeah. Even though she lived in the States. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I'm shocked, but I guess she's, I don't know how old she was, um, but uh, I just, she was iconic for me because when I was 17, that was when Grease came out for me. And so, you know, and I used to sing a lot of Olivia Newton-John songs growing up too. So yeah, that was like, it's a sad moment, really. Yeah. And and we're just here visiting in Australia. And so, um, uh, yeah, I feel quite emotional about it actually. But uh, so she was an important person for me, I guess, in my life, just remembering her when I was young. Of course I was. I used to watch it a lot when I was a kid and teenager. So, yeah, it's a big shock. Um, she's an Australian icon. So, yeah, very upsetting and way too young to die. Yeah. That's right. We're looking at the Sydney Opera House lit up in pink today in honour of Olivia Newton-John, uh, where she must have performed a number of times. The Australians are really, really proud of her, uh, many of them giving their tributes uh, in uh, some of the sound bites we heard earlier. What a gift to the world. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani.